All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for making it tonight. We hope you enjoy the content. The class tonight is titled Cat Peas Smells Like Money, a class where we will talk about where the real money is made, and it's typically through buying those properties that others will pass on based on appearance or, as the title suggests, odors. Quick disclaimer before we get into the content, we're not attorneys. You'll need to consult one with legal questions as we are just sharing our experiences as professional property managers. We have two speakers tonight. The first one to be introduced is Eric Boltman, a retired United States Air Force officer who holds a bachelor's in natural resources tourism. He is a licensed real estate professional here in Alaska and COO of Real Property Management Last Frontier. The company has managed well over a thousand rentals during the life of the company and personally he owns rentals in multiple states. Our second speaker this evening is Ben Crowley, who is the co-owner of Ridge Line Inspections. He is a licensed home inspector and has years of experience in home restoration, fire flood and mold remediation, and new home construction. Okay, everyone, let's get started. This is, uh, this is Eric. So let's talk about the goals of this presentation. What do I want you to come away knowing after this lesson? First off, sorry to burst your bubble, but HGTV shows aren't real. If you need a moment to grieve, I understand. The major goal today is to de-newbie you. I want you to be able to see the potential in a property. I want you to be able to see the past, the god-awful smells, the terrible paint choices, and the neglect to see what the property's potential really is. I want you to recognize that almost without fail, a turnkey property, a move-in remedy property, will be a negative cash flow property. That's fine if you don't mind investing in your mortgage every month. Lastly, I want you to learn how to be ice cold objective in your analysis of a prospective purchase. I want you to feel completely comfortable walking away from bad deals while seeing the good deals that few others can. Okay, we have a lot of material to get through today, so please bear with me if I move fast. I will try and answer questions as much as I can, so long as time allows. I'll be happy to stay afterwards and answer some, but there are people on this call with busy lives to get back to. First off, let's get something straight. Again, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. We're going to deal with reality on reality's terms. I'd be a total hypocrite if I told you not to use loan programs like FHA or VA that allow little to no down. I've used them myself multiple times, but there are trade-offs to them. That's okay. Let's just talk about what those trade-offs are. Okay, first, let's get some of our terms straight so everybody's on the same page. I'm sure we have some newbies on the call. We also have some experienced folks on the call, but let's make sure that we're all working with the same terms. First, OPM. Now, this was a term I first heard coined by Robert Kiyosaki of Rich Dad Poor Dad fame. OPM, other people's money. It is the main leverage point upon which we use to, to build wealth with rental property. And what do we mean when we say other people's money? Well, that's the bank's money. We're going to use the bank's money to buy the property. Then while we own it, we're going to use the tenant's money to build equity and cash flow. When we sell it, we're going to get the future buyer's money in appreciation. And lastly, there's the money you keep instead of Uncle Sam taking it. So while not technically OPM, right, because it's your money, but it's just, it's kind of in that same family because you're keeping more of it. Um, let's go over these other, these other terms we're gonna use a lot. Now, I don't wanna make this into some overcomplicated, bigger pockets analysis, you know, spreadsheet nerd type of thing. Okay, cash flow. That's the money left over after every month. Appreciation, that's the sale value of a property going up over time. So I bought it for 200,000, but I sell it for 225. That's just you know, normal appreciation. Taxes, while I own it, the government is going to allow me to write off a bunch of my expenses because I'm doing something that the government wants me to do, which is provide housing. And so they're gonna give me tax breaks because of that. Last week, equity. The difference between what you paid and what you owe. So we bought it for 200. It went up in 25, went up by 25,000. So that's our appreciation. But let's say we also paid the mortgage down by 25,000. So that other 25,000 is our equity. And whose money did we use to pay for that? Well, if we played our cards right, we used the tenant's money to pay that down. So an additional $25,000 in equity. You know, it's all kind of easy math. Um, 
Lastly, there's something I don't think gets discussed enough in investing circles, and that's time. Okay, that's the sort of the fifth element, right? It's the time, the time you free up through passive investment. The more passive investments, and by passive, I mean I don't have to show up and exchange my hours for dollars anymore. So the more passive investments I can build up, the, the more of the investor I'm becoming. But as long as you're still exchanging hours for dollars, you're, that's still a J-O-B, that's still a job. And, and that's okay. And probably your first property will be a part-time job. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. That's okay, but Let's recognize what it is. Let's call it for what it is. Let's call a duck a duck. That is that first property where you're doing all the work, you're doing the management, you're doing the maintenance. That is your part-time job as a real estate investor. But your goal needs to be to get out of that as quickly as possible. Okay, so in dealing with reality on reality's terms, we have to make sacrifices. We need to decide what we're willing to sacrifice based on our individual situation. So here are the three things we get to pick from, except here's the catch. We only get to pick two. We can pick a lot of cash flow, we can pick a lot of stress, we, or lower stress, we can pick lower initial investment, but we have to make sacrifices. Okay, so let's talk about how this whole triangle works. Let's say you're a busy professional and you want to keep it low stress. Awesome. And you don't want to put a whole lot of money down because you're just getting started. Okay, well, what's our sacrifice? Well, we're probably going to have to sacrifice the cash flow. See, because we're not putting any money down, but we don't want to do the work ourselves, we're going to have a lot of high debt service. And then additionally, that money that that money that would be cash flow is going to go to paying for management and maintenance right which is going to reduce some of that cash flow so um the primary profit source in this is going to be your equity and appreciation basically you are keeping the property afloat or more or less even over time um so that then when you go to sell it you can realize that appreciation and equity and that's a common strategy up in alaska with with the really high cost of uh, to purchase properties up here. The big boy money is generally made in appreciation and equity. What you'll see as you get deeper down the rabbit hole of learning to invest is that in other places, like I own a place in Oklahoma City, or I owned, I just sold it last month, had decent cash flow, but almost zero appreciation and equity. If they just, there's just not that much going on in Oklahoma City. However, there's not a lot of people buying places either, so there's a lot, not a lot of demand, and I was able to purchase it fairly low. Okay, so let's talk about the next scenario. Well, well, I want high cash flow. Okay, fair enough. What else do you want? Well, I, well, I still have a busy job, so I want a low stress. Okay, that's fine. What are we sacrificing? Well, we're going to have to put some money down. So, we're going to keep our debt service low and our cash flow, conversely, high. But that high, that, um, that high cash flow means that we're going to be able to pay some of that cash flow out to managers and maintenance people. But because we put so much money down, our debt service is so low, we still have cash flow left over. So this is that perfect scenario that we'd all like to be in, right? Um, you know, your, your great uncle Bill, uh, bequeaths you, uh, $200,000, you know, and decides that, you know, and says, here, go ahead and invest this for your family. And so you take that money and you put it down on some properties and you have the money to hand it off to a manager. You can use a contractor, get things done and you get to keep your stress low and basically manage the prop, you know, the manage the manage the manager is what we say in the business. So um, now something to keep in mind using, if you, let's say you still used a VA or an FHA loan, and this is kind of what we're getting to in this talk today, is you use a low or no money down program, but you still buy the property for so little because it needs rehabbing 
that you then sink a small more amount of money into getting it under control, but your total investment is still considered low. So while you may not have put a ton down, the, the end result is effectively the same. Okay, well, but Eric, I want high cash flow and I don't have a lot of money to put down. Well, that's okay, there's still a solution for you, but guess what, you just bought yourself a part-time job. That was me back in 2009 when I bought my first fourplex. Now, so we bought that on an FHA loan and uh, total in, no kidding, we were, for the cost of a well inspection, we bought a fourplex for $459,000. Cool thing was my wife was a licensee and back then it was legal to use your commission as a sales agent as the down on an FHA property. Unfortunately, they don't allow you to do that anymore, but you know, there's still things you can do like that. So here we are, we've only got $950 into the property on day one, but guess what? This place needed some serious amounts of work. Like we were wearing masks on the first day going into the, um, you know, going into the, the unit we were about to move into, you know, because, um, you know, us cool real estate investors, we owned N95 masks before it was cool. So, so that, that lower no, no initial investment means that the debt service load is high, right? Because we didn't, that loan wasn't paid down at all. It was, it was max, if not greater than max at the, at the start. But then the maintenance and management, well, fortunately, I was fairly handy and Cassandra was a property manager at the time. It was a licensee. So, but that was effectively our part-time job. There was a lot of hunting and fishing that I did not get to do because I was the manager. I was the maintenance person because I didn't put any money down. That's okay. Again, none of these are wrong. It's just, let's be realistic about what's going to happen. I'm going to get my cash flow, my equity, and my appreciation at the expense of my time. Okay. Now, do I get the huge tax advantage? No, because I'm doing it all myself and I don't get to write off my own time. That's the reality. If I use a manager, if I use a contractor, I can write those expenses off, but I didn't. I did the work myself. So outside of my receipt from Lowe's for the materials, that's where I'm at. Okay, so why are distressed properties so cool? Um, first off, one of the things you'll notice, so my duplex when I bought it was nasty like nasty it had it again if you have to wear a mask your first day in the property this is why the, i called the talk cat pee smells like money seriously you should get all frothy if you start smelling cat pee um and i just want to make sure you guys can see the screens correct amanda yeah eric the visual is great Okay, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't getting I wasn't getting the normal little green border I get. So just check it. So um, this was at a time when duplexes were getting full price offers inside of 24 hours. I mean, the rental market was hot, hot, hot. So because this place reeked, because it looked like a lot of work and the grass was up to your waist and the paint was chipping, Nobody wanted to touch this thing. So in a, in a time when properties are getting out of offers in 24 hours, this thing had been sitting around the market for 400 and I think it was 436 days, something like that. Just, I mean, crazy, over a year. Um, so because other buyers that weren't experienced were looking at it and going, well, that looks like work. I'm not in, in it for the work and would bail. Um, the other cool thing about buying properties in good neighborhoods, you know, bad property, good neighborhood, is you'd be amazed the kind of great rapport you build with your neighbors on day one. Twice, both at my fourplex and my duplex, I've had people pull, you know, neighbors pull me aside and say, thank you for mowing the lawn. Because, like, we were probably the first people in years that had done it. So, um, and you're building nearly instant equity and cash flow because, Again, because the properties are so gnarly, you're working with your agent to buy them at a much lower level, okay? Then lastly, this is where you really learn as an investor. These are the crazy, you know, nutty stories you get to tell your friends at the bar years down the road, you know, during these learning opportunities. 
Okay, so let's talk about one of the first things we're going to do is we want to figure out the general area that we're going to buy in. And for most of us starting out, we're probably going to use an FHA or VA loan. Now, one of the things about an FHA or a VA loan is you are required to live there for the first year. Okay, and don't think you're being cute and don't think you're being smart if you think you're going to lie to the mortgage lender and not really live there because guess what? They're kind of smart on that stuff and they're checking now. Okay, so, um, you know, don't get dinged for mortgage fraud. Don't get your place foreclosed on you because you lied. Like, play the game within the rules. So, okay, so let's say we're going to look just for simplicity's sake, we're gonna look in our local area, right? Which is generally a good way to start because you probably didn't just move here, you know the area, you can kind of get a sense of things. So what are we, now when we start dissecting like, okay, specific areas that I'm gonna work with my real estate agent to say, I wanna look for a place in these areas, okay? And help them out, give them, give them something to work with. Okay, they cannot tell you, I'll let you in on a little not so secret, but most people don't know it, as a licensee, okay, now that's property manager, that's a real estate salesperson, we cannot tell you this is a good neighborhood or a bad neighborhood. That is, that is called steering. Um, uh, that's up to you. you. You can tell them, I don't want to buy in this neighborhood, this is where I want you to do the search, okay? So what are we looking for? What are we typically looking for that makes for a strong neighborhood? Now, um, I like what I call ladder rack neighborhoods. Okay. And every time I say that, people get all confused. That's why there's a truck with a ladder rack on it. Okay. I like to look for trucks with ladder racks because who drives trucks with ladder racks? Generally people in the trades. Okay. Plumbers, handymen, electricians, contractors, framers, all that kind of stuff, right? Those people generally almost always have work. The work is stable. Um, so that's always a good sign. I like blue collar middle class neighborhoods because they're stable. I also like looking for well ranked schools. And I say that as somebody who does not have kids, but guess who does have kids? Probably your tenants. And you think they're checking the schools before they move into an area? You bet you they are. So do that search and say, well, gosh, if, you know, if I buy in this neighborhood, but this is one of the lowest ranked schools in the area, it might be harder to find good tenants. And yeah, that's the truth. So I generally like affordable housing with a garage. Now, does that mean to say that if it doesn't have a garage, it's a bad place? No, but I generally like a place with a garage. It's just that one step up into what we call in the business a B-class property. Okay, that's that kind of middle-class neighborhoods. So if you can get a place with a garage, my first fourplex had garages, which was great. Um, it's generally step up. You're gonna find your life a lot easier as far as finding tenants. They're gonna stay longer because they're gonna move a bunch of stuff into it. I think. Um, if you can find one where HOAs are surrounding the area, when, it, when there's an HOA involved and it's active and it's not too over the top, that's a huge help because you know that part of the neighborhood's not gonna go downhill. You want them reasonably close to town. If you're looking in the valley, okay, are you paying attention? It needs to be reasonably close to town. I don't care if it has granite countertops if it's 35 minutes outside of town, okay? Your tenants are not going to drive an extra half hour so that they can look at granite countertops when they get home, okay? People are looking for a balance in life, okay? And your, your Gucci fourplex isn't that nice. So you need to have employment nearby. That's the other problem with these places out in BFE is there's no employment. People have to have a place to work. They don't want to have to spend the half their day driving. Um, you want a diverse economy. Now this is getting more into like regional type areas. Um, one of the reasons that we invested in Oklahoma City is Oklahoma City has been you know, called the recession proof city. And you want to look for places. You see a lot of this in kind of the Bible Belt states of the of the U.S. Um, you'll see very diverse economies. That's one of the disadvantages we have in Alaska is we tend to kind of, everything goes up and down with oil. Does it mean that you shouldn't invest in Alaska? No, but it's something to consider. One of the other things on a more local level is you'll see places, Dinkle River, that will take a huge hit. 
because everyone says, oh, I'm going to buy an Eagle River because I'm going to only get military tenants. Okay, now, listen, I'm saying this as a veteran. Okay, great. Not all military members are good tenants. And also, when the base really, really needs people in its base housing, like they do right now, guess what? You're going to be struggling to find tenants. Like a lot of places in Eagle River right now are in the apartment kind of in the apartment range. Now, generally, your single family homes are still doing fine. Lastly, okay, this is the most important thing. If you only leave this presentation remembering one thing, okay, would you live there? Would you let your kid live there? Okay, let that sink in. Would you let your kid live there? If you wouldn't, don't buy there. Period. End of discussion. Okay, what are we looking for that are signals of sketchy neighborhoods? Okay, you can find, uh, we've managed some properties that were gorgeous and brand new construction and so well made and had beautiful views. But if you have to drive through some sketchy industrial park, trailer homes, all that kind of stuff, guess who else does too? The potential tenants you're going to be trying to convince to live there. So think about that. Um, if, you know, if it's, if it's like driving through the back streets of Fallujah to get to your gorgeous rental property, think about that. Um, long drives of town, backed up to busy, noisy streets. One of the things, and I lived in my duplex for five years, one of the things that drove me absolutely nuts about it, even though I love this property, I'm going to keep it forever. One of the things that drove me nuts about it was that it backed right up to O'Malley. And every knucklehead on his Harley Davidson or his bro truck or his spark can Honda loved racing up the hill all hours of the night. And it drove me insane. So think about that. You want it close to, you know, like main arterial roads, but maybe not right up on it. Um, <clears throat> you know, sketchy alleyways. Just, again, like if you don't feel safe. Okay, if, if you've ever looked at the, um, what Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the, what's the very bottom one? It's, you know, security. Um, boarded up home and vehicle windows. Um, what that means is that's a, that's a sign of a high crime area. It means that windows are getting busted out to steal things. So I'm not saying if you see one, run, but, but that's an indication, you know, if you're seeing a lot, and you're new to town, you know, and you don't know how, what this neighborhood's like, that's a good indication. Um, watch out for employers closing down, leaving, gang gra graffiti, bad schools. Again, would you let your, if your if you're 17, 18, 19-year-old kid was moving out for the first time, would you be happy if they were living in this neighborhood? And I know it sounds like I'm beating this to death, but trust me, there's a reason that, yeah, because, again, I can't, once you bought it, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Okay, so we've picked our neighborhoods. We told our real estate agent where we want to buy. Now, what are we looking for uh, for signs of a good deal? So, um, you know, bad or only only a few pictures. I love this one with the like horrible Photoshop stove in there. Um, you know, just hacky stuff like that. Um, you know, this one where the the prop or the agent couldn't even take a good picture, barely get out of their car, you know, um, generally those are, you know, that that's what that's a result is somebody went shopping for the cheapest real estate agent. And which means that the property is going to be poorly represented. It's, it's not going to get a lot of attention. Uh, most of your newbies are going to just scroll past and go, Oh, look at these pictures. Oh, this is terrible. There's no pictures. Well, guess what? You're a real estate investor now. So buck up and go out there and go take a look at these ones. And guess what? You're probably going to waste a lot of time looking at these ones with no pictures. Because you might go in and find out that, oh, it's still overpriced or et cetera. But you know what? That's how you find the deals. Why did people walk away from my duplex for 436 days? You know, because it looked like junk. So, <clears throat> you know, cluttered houses, that's another like this bottom picture. You can see where like all the junk left around. That's a lazy seller. Um, tacky paint colors guess what they sell paint at hardware stores you can paint things um it doesn't have to be pink when you're done um i love this one i get 
I have to wipe the drool off my chin when I find out that there's an out owner who's out of state and they're not using a property manager who's local because I know I am going to slaughter them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what the market's doing. They don't know who their tenants are. Um, you'd be amazed at the level of naivety. My first fourplex was purchased from a gentleman trying to self-manage out of Oklahoma. So there's no such thing as out of state managing. Um, if you know what you're doing. Okay, so <coughs> we've done our, we've done it, we've picked our neighborhood, we've done our web search, we've got a list of addresses. Now, before we blow up our poor real estate agent's phone, we're going to go spend a little bit of gas money and we're just going to go drive by it first, right? Because if you want your real estate agent to like you, okay, you don't want to be blowing up their phone all the time doing wild goose chases. So, um, Go do a drive-by first and go check out the neighborhood. Um, one of the easier ways if you're trying to kind of take it easy on the driving is you can use Google Street View. Just keep in mind that, you know, that can be dated. Um, the best one is just, you know, go get some Mickey D's and go driving around at all your addresses and bring notepads and write down what you, what you see. So what are you looking for? You want the worst looking property in an otherwise good neighborhood. You're looking, you're looking for signs of neglect because you want to see signs of neglect. And I know that's hard to wrap your head around, but you want to find signs of neglect. You want to see overgrown lawns because you own a lawnmower. You want to see weeds because you can put down weed and feed. You want to see roof moss because you own a paint scraper and a ladder. You want to see wood rot because you own a saw. You want to see failing fences. Again because you own a saw, right? These are easily fixed issues, but they're major cosmetic eyesores and they drive most people away. But again, I want you to see past that. I want you to sit there. I want you to, when you look at a property, I want you to be sitting there making a list of the repairs and estimating cost in your head. That's how an investor thinks. You're looking for early signs of tenants out of control. Now this is getting a little bit deeper into, um, what the, you know, like maybe you should probably have a manager involved if the tenants are getting really out of control. Um, but, you know, if, if you're fairly experienced, um, you know, or if you're a glutton for punishment, you can actually look for a good property with tenants that are out of control. Uh, that's a lot of what we get hired to do is people that, you know, things got a little out of hand. And so they'll, they'll say, hey, you know, okay, I, I need help. And it'll, but I'm going to warn you, it'll typically take at least a year to get, especially on larger buildings, to get everything back under control. Because remember, most leases are about a year. So sometimes, you know, there's only so much you can do, especially right now within the law. Um, so what are signs of those, you know, abandoned vehicles, litter, mattresses, couches laying around, that kind of stuff. Now, if you're seeing mattresses and couches in the neighbor's yard, I want you to keep driving. Because you cannot change who the, who the neighbor puts in his property. If he fired, hired the cheapest property manager in town and that person is, and they never drive by the property and there's just a bunch of garbage laying around, um, guess what? You can't fix that. And I say that as a guy who has cleaned up a lot of other people's lawns for houses I don't manage just because I was sick of looking at the trash. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to, so you've talked to your real estate agent, you've, you've looked at 10 properties, you picked five or you picked three that you said, okay, I think these are the, these are the sexy ones. So we're going to go look at, we're going to go look at some properties. So first off, wear proper footwear. Okay. Um, you're not showing up in dress shoes and slacks. You're not showing up in flip flops like these losers on these fake TV shows on HGTV. You're showing up in, in boots that you could you know, potentially step on, you know, a rotting deck or you could get muddy, you could get into a crawl space, especially in winter. You'd be amazed how the, the, the investors really come out of the woodwork in the winter. That's when they're hunting because nobody else is. So guess what? You're probably going into the attic and, uh, you know, Ben, who's also on here, will we'll probably talk about this in a little bit. Um, you're going to go into the attic with your, with your home inspector or your real estate agent. You may not on the initial inspection, but you know, on the actual home inspection. Um, but you know, keep in mind, you're going to be probably walking on some grungy carpet. Um, so bring a, bring proper footwear, a good flashlight or a headlamp, 
no, don't use your phone. You may be using your phone to record something at the same time. Um, so I really like a headlamp because I can keep my hands free, especially if I'm crawling into a crawl space. Um, bring a pen and notepad. I want you to take notes, okay? Lots and lots of notes. What units are occupied? That's something you want to know ahead of time. Okay. Who's supposed to be living there? One of the things I love is when a, a manager doesn't know who lives there. So let's say you're working with your real estate agent. You walk up to unit three and he says, okay, we're supposed to be meeting Kelly here. And knock on the door and some dude answers and goes, hello? Like, hey, uh, we're looking for Kelly. Oh, she don't live here no more. I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, this is going to be a deal, right? Because clearly this manager or clearly this owner has no idea what they're doing and I'm going to beat them up in due diligence, right? So already I'm watching the price come down as they're saying this. Um, I'd like to arrive 30 minutes early. Again, go get some lunch. Don't park in front of the place, okay? Park a couple houses down, park inconspicuously and just chill and watch the place. I really like doing this, if you're serious about a property, I really like doing this around like six or seven o'clock at night and just watch what's going on, right? You'll be able to spot drug activity. You'll be able to spot like who's living there. Are the, you know, are the cars in general good condition or is, you know, that's weird. There's been 10 visitors who've spent 10 minutes only at unit seven. Right, that might be a sign of eh, it might be some drug dealing going on. So, okay, so you're doing your walkthrough. What's the crazy stuff that's normally going to scare off the noobs that that I want you to get excited about? Bad smells, love cat pee, um, smoke, despair. Yes, despair has a smell. Every foreclosure I walk into, every trashed out property every eviction, they all have the same smell. It just, it's just a human despair. Um, don't worry, it goes away. Uh, look for cluttered mechanical rooms. I know, you know, Ben's sitting here looking at this picture, probably his spine is curling as he's seeing a bunch of stuff stuffed up against a boiler, you know, or a furnace right now. Because all he's seeing is a house fire and he's exactly right. Um, trashed up and beat up hallways. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Because guess what? That's easily fixed. It's easily fixed. But you know what it also does? Is it makes it really hard to rent. And that guy probably settled for rents that were lower than he could have gotten because he wasn't willing to fix his hallways. Or because he was using a hack property manager who didn't tell him his property, his, his hallways needed rehabbing. Because the property manager doesn't like to call and send him bills. Or doesn't like to ask for money to fix things. Hired paint. You see this a lot in the townhouses. By the way, I love buying townhouses. You see this a lot in the townhouses that were built in the 90s because the, like, the paint's just barely passable still and it's okay, but you can run your hand across it and it literally feels like dry skin. Again, easily fixable, but it looks dull. It looks tired. And it was generally um, the contractors that built it, it's the original contractor paint, they, they generally go with a kind of a more matte finish and they'll spray it on and it just it feels like it was sprayed on 25 years ago so um when appropriate without prying i recommend talking with tenants as you're waiting to go inside as the real estate agent's trying to find the right keys etc other another good clue of hack owners and hack property managers is ziploc bags with a bunch of unlabeled keys Right, that is total amateur hour stuff. And again, when you see that, don't get frustrated, get excited. Because that means this person doesn't know what they're doing. You do, because you listen to your good buddy Eric tell you all this stuff, and you're gonna get all excited about it because, oh good, this is an amateur. I know what I'm doing. We're gonna beat this guy up on price. Okay, slow down and look. It's a, okay. I bought my first house in Oklahoma City, and it was really common to have sinking. And so I learned the habit to look at the corners of the wall where the wall meets the ceiling 
And I've found that that's a great habit, especially post earthquake, because that's when you see a lot of stress fractures. And so you, that will clue you into more of the stuff that Ben's going to talk about, which is like the serious stuff that maybe you should walk away from. Again, take notes. You think you're going to remember this stuff. No, you're not. Take notes. Okay. Um, it might even be a good idea. If it's okay, if you're walking through it, an empty unit, it's generally okay. Don't do it in somebody's occupied unit, but you can record as you walk through. I had to do that once out of necessity because the tenant on our first walkthrough had accused us of stealing a diamond necklace that didn't exist. And so to prevent that from happening on the second walkthrough, we actually carried a video camera and recorded the entire thing. Okay, so um, what are we looking for as far as like, here's the other stuff we're looking for as far as amateur landlords, okay? So this is the due diligence phase, okay? You and your agent have decided that, ooh, we like this property. This, this one's a cash flow king right here. So now we're starting to get paperwork back from the, um, from the seller. We probably put in an offer at this point. Now, what are we looking for as far as signs that somebody doesn't know what they're doing? Does their lease, is their lease like one or two pages and clearly pulled off Google, right? Um, do they not have leases? Do the names not match the leases? Do they have no record of when the tenant last paid? How much do they owe? What is their security deposit? Oh yeah, that's right. Jenny in unit three borrowed from her security deposit back in April of 2013, right? need to know that stuff. And if they don't know, guess what? If your agent's any good, they're going to be taking notes and they're going to be using that to beat up on the seller. So um, is it illegal to borrow from a security deposit? Let's say Jenny in unit three uh, lost her job due to COVID-19. Is it illegal for the landlord to allow her to use some of her security deposit money? No. Is it probably dumb? Yes. Okay. And that's totally a decision you want to make on your own personal basis. But what's going to happen is pretty soon, um, Jenny's thousand dollar security deposit is a $250 security deposit and then a $0 security deposit. And then what, why is Jenny going to not trash the apartment when she leaves? So, um, there's nothing, again, nothing illegal, but what I you know, run into all the time, oh yeah, old Bill over in unit two, well, he mows the lawn, so I give him a break. I mean, not that any of this stuff is in writing, and oh, by the way, his lease still says he pays 1000 but he really pays 750 But again, none of this is in writing. I'm just like, oh, this is amateur hour stuff. Okay, this is going to be a little bit in the weeds, but I want you to think about this. When Bill's not paying attention and runs over his foot or jams his foot underneath that lawnmower, whacks off a good portion of his foot, goes to pay the medical bills and can't, goes and talks to a lawyer, the lawyer says, well, you just need to sue. Well, who do we sue? Well, we're going to sue the homeowner. Well, the homeowner does, I mean, I don't think he's, he's a really nice guy. Yeah but his homeowner's insurance is going to pay. Okay. And you better hope it does. You better hope the least of your consequences is that the homeowner's insurance goes up. It might be that the homeowner's insurance finds out a reason that they say, wait, I'm sorry, you, you didn't disclose this or that. We're not covering this claim. Bill isn't licensed. Bill isn't insured. Bill isn't bonded. We don't have to cover this claim. Guess who's paying for Bill's canes for the rest of his life and his follow-up medical appointments, okay? I know it sounds like I'm making a big damn deal over you know, Bill mowing the lawn to get $250 off his rent, but it is a big damn deal, okay? So be a professional, put it in writing, and you know, hire real, real companies that have um, that kind of stuff. So a suspicious estoppel certificates, I won't dive too deep into that, but your, your agent should know what an estoppel certificate is. It's basically a disclosure of any agreements on the property. And the most common one is leases. If it's kind of like, gee, that's weird. The estoppel certificate says the leases are 1300, but this lease right here says it's only for a thousand. 
red flag. Okay. If you get a, you know, and yes, there are agents in town who will forge estoppel certificates and have gotten caught doing it. So, um, again, just look for signs that the owner doesn't know what's going on at the property. That's, that should get you all frothy <clears throat> because that means you're going to beat them up. You're going to ask them for perfectly legit legitimate things that you know they don't have. All right, Ben, you'll get a break from my nasally drone. Ben, why don't you talk about, like, talk to us about the stuff that you see on home inspections that you would say for most, like, newbie investors would be, okay, probably time to walk away from this one until you've got, uh, you know, the money in the bank to handle these kind of issues. Yeah, definitely. So the big things you want to look for is you want to look for water that's been coming in for a while. Like that's an easy thing to see. Look at your sinks, your bathrooms. Like Eric said, get in your crawl space. I don't know how many homes they get fresh paint. You go down the crawl space and they are just hammered. Um, moisture can cause a lot of problems, even a little bit. So um, the big ones, if it's a wood foundation, it's going to cause rot, you know, Pull back the insulation that's hiding those foundation walls while you're down there, look at them. Water leaves a trail. Water flowing in leaves dirt and residue, stains, deposits. Look for those things like um, wood foundations, um, unless they've been really, really well taken care of. Most of those are from the eighties and that's a long time ago and wood is not necessarily gonna last being buried in the ground. So. Um, if the rest of the home's good, a wood foundation might be okay, but it might be something to uh, to pass over on. Um, look at the heating systems, especially boilers. There's a lot of old boilers that are still getting limped along. Look for signs of corrosion. Um, that's going to be white, powdery stuff around joints or puddles underneath. Look for rust. Um, look for leaks. Just look for wet spots. See where it's coming from. Is it coming from underneath the boiler unit, or is it just coming from a joint that needs fixed? Um, you know, if you've got to do a boiler, you're talking 15, 16 grand usually, you know, that's a big deal if it's shot. Um, look, look at the year. Um, 1978 is a pretty pivotal year as far as building materials go for Alaska and the nation. Um, down there at the bottom or anything environmental, it's asbestos and lead-based paints were outlawed. So, um, that doesn't mean that properties older than that haven't had it taken care of. But that's just something to keep in mind. If you start tearing out walls, working on that, especially if you're hiring contracts to do the work, that can get really expensive really fast because they're not allowed to remove it unless it's properly abated. So that's going to double, sometimes triple the cost of even redoing drywall and stuff. Um, get in your attic. That's the biggest place to look. Look to see what it looks like. Like Eric said, in the wintertime, it's a great time to look at houses because there's a lot of things that the wintertime will teach you about your home that the summertime won't. One is uh, ice dams. Look for them in the corners of the roofs. Um, it usually happens when there's bad insulation for a long period of time in the roof. Um, ice dams um, look small. What they can do is they can cause your shingles and your roof to go bad just because the water as the ice builds up, the water plane levels out and it allows the moisture to sneak up under the shingles the way that they're not supposed to. And it freezes and expands, pushes your shingles apart and causes roof damage. Um, the other thing too is it lets you see if your roof's breathing properly. Um, ventilation is a big thing in Alaska. We heat and cool, and there's big temperature swings between inside and outside. And everybody's house makes a little bit of moisture. So get in your attic, look at it, look for signs of water, look in the dust, look for puddles that have dried out and that kind of stuff. Um, mold is another big thing. So especially when you start getting into bathrooms and kitchens under sinks, that kind of stuff, a little bit you see on the outside of the wall could be more on the inside. If it looks like it's just next to a water tank, that might not be too big of a deal. But if it's a little bit, this looks like the bathroom has been leaking, the toilet's been dripping and leaking and stuff, that can get to a lot bigger deal between walls and flooring and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, we talk about structure stuff a little bit. Look in the foundation. Look for big cracks down low. Look in the corners of doors and windows. And the cracks that you're looking for are the jagged cracks that just kind of go off in every direction. You know, 
in the top corners, you will see um, like a windows to see it'll just take off. Um, cracks that run along a seam, it's obviously just a drywall pop. Some of that stuff doesn't necessarily indicate huge structural movement. Um, but your windows don't open right, they're jammed, you can tell there's cracks around it. That means there may be some structural stuff that moved. Um, look at tile too. You know, look in your bathrooms and stuff. See how that tile's been maintained around your tub surrounds. Um, moisture will get in there. You'll be looking at mold and instead of just redoing a bathroom, a little bit of tile, a bit of paint, you start tearing open stuff and you've got a lot more that you're going to be doing. Um, older houses can sometimes be older septics too. I know some, a lot of Anchorage is still on city sewer and stuff, which is good, but especially in the valley, there's a lot of septic systems that are 30 years old and they're getting up there and that's just something else. You know, you're looking at 10 to 20 grand sometimes depending to do a, uh, to do a septic. So just take the whole picture of the home into it. Um, you know, if it smells like pets, that's usually pretty cheap to fix. Little kills, little paint, little carpet, you're good to go. If it smells wet and damp and like it's been wet and damp for a long time, it's really important to take a good look at that and see what else it is. Um, paint doesn't necessarily cover mold. Um, you can paint it, it's still going to off gas and still do its stuff that it's supposed to. So if there is a major mold issue, that's something that needs to be addressed properly and not just painted over because your tenants get sick and it's because there was mold that you knew about that you painted over that can be a big big deal um the other thing too is is that how much can you do like eric was saying how much time are you going to spend working on it how much are you going to pay a handyman to do you know and you definitely want to hire a licensed bonded qualified professional to do all your work you don't want to get the guy that's doing it for 45 dollars off craigslist because you're going to get a 45 dollar an hour job. Um, a good handyman is going to be 65 or 70 plus dollars an hour and he's going to give you good work. He's going to have the insurance to back up what he does. So if he does repair, and it doesn't work. It's not just you trying to find him again and get him to, um, to fix it. So, um, and as far as framing and stuff, like look for big cracks, look for stuff that's moved. You look at your footers, that's the concrete that attaches your house to the ground. Make sure those bolts are still there. See if stuff's crumbling. See, make sure there's not wood posts in your crawl space that are resting directly on the ground. Those need to be on good concrete or it needs to be steel pylons that have been driven into the ground. You don't want wood on dirt as at all in the crawl space as far as your support goes. The ground's gonna shift and your whole house is gonna move. Um, look for doors that don't open and close right. That's another sign that it, maybe there's been some movement, that kind of stuff. Um, so that's not the cosmetic stuff, paint, drywall, that kind of stuff is, it's pretty easy. Um, furnaces, you know, a new furnace is going to be between five and 10 grand and you're going to want to, you know, get that stuff checked out before you buy, you know, home inspections um, and mechanical systems inspections are very important because it's usually a couple hundred dollars to have an HVAC specialist come out and take a look at the heating system small repairs generally cost more than that. So don't skip on getting the property checked out like that, doing your due diligence and just giving it a good once over. And it's like a good job interview because you're, you know, you're getting a job. You want to look at it more than just one time, look at it two or three times, get a home inspection and you know, don't just fall in love with it the first time you walk through it. So, um, I know one of, one of the things I look for is, you know, somebody who is not a home inspector is I look to see if the heating system is relatively clean. If it's just caked in dust, then I know it's probably hasn't been serviced in a very long time. And, you know, and, and that now I'm even more interested and I want to, I want to bring in a, you know, a, a professional like, you know, like Ben to take a look at it. Um, you know, just as a side note, if, if you, if you currently own a rental property um, and you're, and you just, you know, let's say you're kind of worried about some of this stuff, um, Ben will kind of do a, like a home inspection light. Uh, do you want to talk about that real quick, Ben? Like just kind of like, is kind of a preventative like checkup? Yeah, definitely. So I've got two maintenance inspections that we do. The first one we call our arc inspection. 
and it's the home inspection line, like things. So it stands for attics, roofs, and crawl spaces. We come in, I come in, we look at the big stuff that you don't see every day, that your tenants don't see every day, and make sure that you don't have big water leaks, you don't have big damage and stuff like that. Um, and you should you should be doing that, or somebody should be looking at your properties at least once a year and giving it a good one. So I like to do it in the springtime. Um, after the snow is gone and it's just kind of still a little bit wet, you get to see as the ground thaws where the moisture is coming in, if there is any. Um, then we also do all recommend like every five years, just get a full home inspection done, top to bottom, electrical, heating, all of it, so you can stay on top of your maintenance. A home's like a car, you gotta change the oil, you gotta change tires, you gotta buy belts, you gotta buy brake shoes. Yeah, ignoring it's not gonna make it any cheaper. So, yeah. all right, sweet. Um, okay, so what are we looking for as, as far as, what are those problems that you find that are probably out of your control to fix? Okay. Um, this is a big one. Um, and this is one of those things that you can probably identify really early on, on using just a Google, Google satellite view, bad parking, bad or insufficient parking. Like if I'm putting my life into God's hands, every time I pull out of this parking space, because it's, you know, backed right up onto the street, I don't like, no, no, that's not going to work. And your tenants aren't going to like it. Um, they're probably just not going to rent it. Um, illegal activity that's, you know, clearly obvious nearby. You know, most people, you know what to look for. Um, bad neighbors. We talked about this. There's, there's only so much you can do about bad neighbors. Um, the rent price is dropping for that type of property. Does it talk to a property manager about this? Okay. I, I'm going to, please don't ask your real estate agent what rent prices are. Okay. Real estate, like I don't quote prices of properties for sale because I don't sell properties. Don't ask your real estate agent for, for rent prices because they likely don't rent properties. And if they're any good, they probably stay out of that and focus on doing what they're best at, which is selling homes. So, um, talk to a property manager and ask him what are rent prices doing in that area? There's, so, you'd be surprised. So many new investors like to call us up and say, well, what's the vacancy rate? And I try to explain to them, well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. No, no, no. I just need to know what the vacancy rate is. Okay. I get it. You just got done watching a guru class and reading on bigger pockets. You're a genius. Here's your vacancy rate. Goodbye. There's a lot more to it than that. It depends. It depends. Like a townhouse right now is going, a properly priced townhouse is going to rent 172 hours right now. A, a low income duplex, or excuse me, a low income two bedroom apartment right now, uh, you might be looking at 45 days to rent. So, it just depends on that type and a good property manager is going to know what's going on. A property manager with a big enough portfolio. Okay. Somebody just starting out is probably not going to know. Um, watch out for newer and nicer competition close by there. Um, one time my maintenance manager and I posed as uh, roommates and we went over to a really nice, uh, you know, large apartment building that was for lease down the street. And kind of went, came walking away going, man, if I was actually looking for an apartment, I would totally rent this one over the one we're managing right now. You know, and, and, and that's the kind of, you got to look at it objectively. And this comes back to not falling in love with a property until you've already bought it. Okay. Um, ben, what are signs of flood repairs? I know I look for you know, lots of patchy drywall. Um, I also look for like in the older properties, like 1940s, 1960s, I always look at the ceilings and you'll see where the pipe runs are and they've made a bunch of patches because of these like little electrolysis pinholes like you see in this picture. What are you, what are you looking for as a pro to like spot, oh, did they, were, were they trying to cover up a flood? Yeah, um, one of the things I look for in a bathroom is really tall coat base. People will, and that's the rubber trim that you can buy that's cheap, you see in commercial buildings. You can get it up to six inches tall. So 
if they're trying to just cut out a little bit on the bottom and cover up something that's there, that's one thing. Um, a room that looks way, way nicer than the rest of the place. Like the bathroom's all remodeled and looking pretty and there's like brand new carpet in the hall, but the rest of the house looks like it's from 1995. That's something. Um, in the crawl spaces, look for white powder on the dirt. If somebody's had a big sewer backup, they'll go get lime from Lowe's or Home Depot and sprinkle it down there to, uh, to cover up the smell. And it, it does digest it, but if it's not taken care of and covered properly with vapor barrier, it can still release pathogens and stuff up, which are, can cause diseases and make people sick and make it smell bad. Um, I'm looking for sinkholes next to the house. I'm looking for driveways that slope at the home and you know, looking for MDF trim, that's the white cheap trim you see. It's basically cardboard. I'm looking for it to be swollen and freshly painted in places, you know. Yeah, it'll have like blisters typically at the bottom. Yep. Um, on a side note, that's one of the best places to get rid of cat pee too. You got it, you can't find it, you can't get the smell. You usually check the trim around your doors. It's a good spot to get rid of it too. Um, yeah, um, a fresh piece of shiny pipe um, or PEX, which is that nice new plastic stuff, just in a small section in a otherwise copper uh, or all metal pipe system. Yep. Um, one of the things, okay, here's another thing that I want you to remember coming away from this. At no point will you ever buy a property. I don't care if it's got four units or 500 at no point will you ever buy a rental property without walking into every unit period because do you want to be surprised do you know that there might be real estate agents that would only show you the nicest cleanest most beautiful unit at the building and not the one that's been chain smoked in for the last 11 years right um so if you get some excuse about oh sorry we can't see that unit okay that's fine when can we uh, look for suspiciously high rents. This is happening a lot lately. So what what they'll do, okay, a lot of newbie landlords think that they can, like high rents are going to run the bad tenants off. That's not how that works. What you're going to get is tenants who um, can't rent anywhere else because of their background. So they're going to have to overpay to live here. So, why you're concerned about suspiciously high rents for the area, one, you're probably not going to recreate it, okay? Maybe rents are going down and you wanna buy it value without a pro based on what the rents are doing today. Um, but secondly, what you'll see is um, if I wanna unload, let's say I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a morally onerous property owner and I decide I want to unload a, a, a real peg of a property, that I know is not getting good enough rent to justify my ridiculously high price is I will rent all the units to a bunch of, you know, um, dirt bags and drug dealers who are willing to overpay to live there. Um, just so that I can say, look at these numbers. Isn't this amazing? Look at how, boy, this is a cash flow king. And then, and you're kind of going, gee, I wonder why this place in this neighborhood is doing so well and everything else is doing poorly. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly what's going on. Okay, so we're going to pause here for a second. Okay, so you've let's say you've picked out a property, you maybe made an offer on it. You don't have to buy it. It's okay to walk away if you're getting the willies. And I'm not saying that everything is going to feel awesome, but I'm telling you, like you don't have to buy it. But once you do, you have to pay for it. And that's not just the mortgage. That's the pipe break at 3 a.m. that you're paying the plumber time and a half or double time to fix, okay? Once you buy it, you're committed. So keep coming to these classes. Keep learning as much as you can. I'm not telling you to go into analysis paralysis. But remember, it's okay to pause. I saw a guy go out with two and a half million dollars at his um, to disperse, and he bought every piece of hot garbage that
that hit the market. And he was losing $20,000 a month. Now, eventually, that $2.5 million ran out. Okay, so if you're just starting out, don't, you know, don't drive your real estate agent nuts, you know, but just learn, take your time, and it's okay to walk away from a bad deal. It's a lot easier to walk away and apologize to your real estate agent or maybe even give up your earnest money because earnest money is going to feel awful cheap when you get an $8,000 boiler bill because you rushed into a property you didn't do your due diligence on. Okay, here are two items that neither you nor I possess. There are no time machines. We cannot go back in time and make the amount you paid for the property go lower. Okay. There are no magic wands. We cannot make the rent prices go up for you. I consider ourselves very good at advertising properties. We pay a lot of money in addition to you know, these back-end systems to do really, really good advertising. We take great pictures. We spend a lot of money on photography equipment. We do walkthrough videos. I have some really talented, both my guys that do leasing have either, one has graduated and one is working on their degrees in property management. But I cannot make the economy improve for you. I can't make the rent prices go up. So don't game your numbers just to make, make things work, okay? Um, because once you've got that mortgage, unless you can get some miracle refi or something like that, or Uncle Ned passes on and you can put a bunch of money into it and refi it, I can't go back in time and fix your mortgage. Okay, so let's say you didn't get the willies. You think, okay, this is, it's stinky and I love it. I want to buy this place. This is a great rental property. Okay, um, here's some common stuff that I just want you to be prepared for. You're going to have outdated fixtures. You are probably going to replace all the sockets and switches. There's going to be coaxial cables everywhere. You're going to fix probably some popcorn ceilings, sagging subfloors around toilets, leaking plumbing, pet urine, smoke damage, and trash. See that big dumpster back there? That was one of four we filled up in a single family home in Oklahoma City. That was all the trash that was inside that property. It was that bad. This is one picture here on the bottom. This is one of, this is the garage. You should have seen the bedrooms. It was, it was terrifying. So yeah, but lots of, uh, you know, porn from the 1980s and VCRs for some reason. Okay, you bought it, you've cleaned it all out. Now it's time to go buy the materials. Okay, because you listen to your good buddy, Eric, and on his super awesome presentation, you can now consider yourself warned. You are not allowed to buy off the discount rack at Lowe's and Home Depot. There you go. I saved you all sorts of problems. Okay. Yes, that tile is 30% off. They have four of them. Okay. When the tenant drops something and chips that tile, are you going to be able to find more to replace it or fix it? No. You're going to end up doing what you probably should have done before, which is replace it all and now buy some spares. So, um, Stay away from the discount rack. Same thing goes for plumbing. You can't, you can't find the parts to fix the discontinued Moen faucet. So, okay, renovating. Okay, we're not on HGTV. We're going to do this right. We're going to make durable repairs. We're not doing a 22-minute episode. We're going to make repairs that last. So what are your rules of thumb? The repairs, the things you do in there are going to be easy to maintain. Durable, consistent, okay, consistent, again, this is why you're not shopping the discount rack, modern, but not over the top, and appealing to a wide variety of people, okay, so tone it down, Karen, easy on the accent walls, okay, 
It will take you, I hope this is nobody on here actually named Karen, right? I was just making a joke. <laughs> it will take longer than you think. It will cost more than you think and you will find unexpected problems. That's okay. This is all part of the fun learning process. But because you hired a smart guy like Ben to do a home inspection, you're not going to get uh, caught with anything super expensive. Okay. Um, you're going to find that stuff early and it's mostly going to be cosmetic at this point. Lighting. Consistency matters. Pick a finish and stick with it. Okay, nothing drove me crazier as a leasing guy than walking into a place, trying to photo photograph a place, and all the light bulbs are, the, are different colors because the, it shows up even worse in a, in a picture. Um, if all the finishes are different, it drives you nuts. And a lot of tenants, like, they're looking at it, and it's like they can't quite put their finger on it, but it's like, and it, it's, it's the discount rack at Home Depot effect. It's, well, I need a doorknob, so they went and found the cheapest doorknob. doesn't matter that now they have seven different finishes of doorknobs in the house. Um, LED is great. Uh, don't, it's not a necessity, but it is one of those nice things that if, if you can swing it, you replace the pictures with LEDs just because it's less hassle. The tenants aren't going to leave, you know, uh, they're not going to replace the light bulbs. Um, satin nickel, which is that sort of kind of brushed, looks like brushed aluminum. Really hard to go wrong with that right now. Uh, avoid single bulb fixtures in bedrooms. I see this all the time where somebody went and bought the cheapest fixture and slapped it into a bedroom of a fourplex and it's like you could barely see in that thing and it's, it's like a horror movie. So uh, a little bit too much light is better than not enough. Specialty bulbs, you'll see those mostly in fancy kitchen and bath fixtures. Avoid them like the plague. Um, it's just I hate sending an owner a big bill for the maintenance guy's time because he spent half the day trying to find this ridiculous MX 10 dash 304 B seven bulb. And it's just, okay. Lastly, unless you're an electrician, please stay away from rewiring any complicated, you know, if you like switches and that kind of thing. Um, I've seen some, pretty scary properties that I thought, man, this is a house fire waiting to happen because somebody tried to do their own wiring and you'd like turn on a light in one room and it shut off the light in the other. Um, if you're going to replace basic switches and stuff like that, that's probably okay. That's totally up to your own risk assessment, but um, stay away from the complicated stuff. Leave it to the pros. Uh, flooring. Um, I really like upstairs. Um, like I like carpet upstairs. Um, bedrooms. I really like carpet and bedrooms. Um, Car carpet is always the quietest option and should therefore almost always be used in the up upper floors. But don't skimp on the pad. Don't buy a cheap pad. You can immediately tell it's a cheap pad. I'd rather see you save a little, excuse me, a little bit of money on carpet, but spend that little bit extra on the pad. It will last longer. It'll feel better. And it's just one of those sort of psychological things that people notice. LVT, luxury vinyl tile. You can see this, this stuff in the upper right hand corner is what I call, is, is what's called Allure. Um, I'm not a huge Home Depot guy, more of a Lowe's man myself, but I do really like the Allure product at Home Depot. Very easy to install myself. Um, you can really, you can just basically install it with, with a um, box cutter. Um, lasts a long time. It doesn't glue to the floor. Um, so that stuff lvt is basically looks just like laminate a lot of times it's hard to tell but it's quieter and it's waterproof that's the big thing it is waterproof just like ben was saying that that um mdf uh uh help me out here ben the mdf trim is is like cardboard so is laminate laminate's just basically uh sawdust so you you can always tell when they put laminate right up against the entryways. Uh, it's always blistered because, you know, snowy boots and dogs and dog bowls in the kitchen, things like that. Um, tenants love LVT, especially when you explain to them that, like, you can spill wine, you, the kids can spill Kool-Aid, and everything's going to be okay. Uh, I definitely avoid carpet in the kitchen or dining room. No light-colored carpets, okay? You're not going to put white carpet down just because it was the cheapest on the rack at Home Depot, okay? Because guess what? You're going to be replacing it in a year. Um, 
avoid laminate upstairs and really definitely avoid laminate upstairs. LVT is okay, but I've done a lot to try and soundproof um, even LVT and it just, I just don't like it upstairs unless the place is really built well as far as the flooring to avoid sound transmission issues. Um, try to stick with carpet upstairs. Okay. Walls of paint. I, I used to paint a hospital um, back in the day. Uh, please take your time repairing the walls. Okay. Um, that spot that you kind of did a half-assed job of, repa re of repairing that hole in the wall, it's only going to get more obvious after you paint it. So go ahead and if you don't know how to get to do good drywall work, YouTube is your friend. If you still don't know after that, um, you know, tap in a pro. Take off the outlet covers, please. Stop painting your outlet covers. I see this all the time and it's just, it's so bad. It's just nothing says ghetto like painted outlet covers and light switches. Um, learn how to cut, okay? And cutting and painting means drawing a straight line with a paintbrush. It's, it's very easy to learn. I guarantee you can learn it. This is my favorite brush right here is the Purdy XL three inch extra stiff. And I know that's like totally nerdy stuff, but that you'd have to be a painter to understand. But it's just, um, this, you see these, these, you know, Lowe's and Home Depot commercials where they, you know, they rip off the painter's tape and there's cutesy music in the back and everybody high fives and oh, it looks great. No, it doesn't. Painter's tape doesn't work that way. Okay, it can if you spend a fortune on really good painter's tape and you take all sorts of time like treating it and pressing it and all this other stuff. But this is this picture on the right is that's what it generally looks like when you're done. If you try to cut an edge with painter's tape, painter's tape's okay. It's really to help you avoid making mistakes or accidentally getting paint on something you didn't intend to. But it will not help you cut a straight line. It'll actually make it worse. Um, Buy a lot more paint than you think you need because you will store some for later repairs. Uh, don't buy the cheapest. I typically like satin in the living areas. I like semi-gloss in the kitchen and baths because it's a little bit easier to clean up. And always, always, always store it somewhere warm because paint that freezes is destroyed. Colors. Please stick with neutral colors. Okay, the bold colors, they may look really nice the day of, but they're gonna immediately start fading. What that means is maybe go, well, I don't care if it fades a little bit. You're gonna care a lot when you're trying to patch it and you're like, but this is from the same bucket I painted from. Why doesn't the color match anymore? Well, it's because the background color faded. So accent walls are okay. Um, just kind of take it easy on them. Like pick your main color and then maybe pick, some, pick an accent wall color and stick with a kind of a neutral soft color. Um, you'd be surprised the dumb stuff people will get, like they'll decide they don't like a place because of an accent wall. And it's like, and the owners poured, I'm sure, months of work into this place and tenants walk in and they're like, oh God, what is this? So tr again, appeal to a wide range of people, keep it kind of neutral. It doesn't need to be hospital sterile. It can have some personality, but just try to kind of tone it down. Um, don't paint the fireplace rocks unless like you have no other alternative. But generally I've seen a lot of people where it's like, I don't know, it's weird in like the nineties and two thousands, people started painting the fireplace rocks from the seventies. It just, it looks God awful. Um, no murals. Okay. Keep the inspirational quotes on Facebook and uh, stay away from like complicated finishes and wallpaper. They just don't hold up again. That comes back to that durability. Um, my lovely wife Cassandra in a you can see you can literally see the pea stains right there on the floor that was such a gross house um okay stuff the stuff that you're going to do that you did, probably didn't think of that you need to budget for um you're probably going to change out all the outlet and switch covers that's very common um you're going to need to mow and weed the lawns you um I love a bunch of super long like three inch fine thread decking screws and right at that stage, you can see Cassandra sit sitting just on the subfloor. Because I love walking around the house doing this little dance looking for squeaks. And then I find this, this floor joist and I drive one of those three-inch decking screws in everywhere I find a squeak. 
and it makes the house feel so much quieter and so much nicer because I've taken care of all the squeaks. Um, watch out for leaks. This is a good chance to like keep finding, looking for anything that might have been missed. Uh, look, you're probably going to have to replace some broken and chipped bath, you know, kitchen and bath fixtures. That's very common. Um, don't buy the, the fancy colored sinks. All it's going to look like is just one giant massive coffee stain in a year. Stick with stainless steel. I just bought myself a new sink in, in my house. It's stainless steel. Uh, do, you're probably going to have to paint the trim. You probably, please, 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 please don't sink a bunch of money and time into a place and then ignore the heating registers. They're very easy to fix. They're very easy to replace the parts. Wear gloves. You will cut yourself if you don't. Um, and I like the high temperature, just rattle can, you know, Krylon style paint. And it'll have a little barbecue uh, picture on the front. So you can clean them up with a wire brush, clean them off real good, um, bend them back into shape or replace them and then spray them back to that nice white using the high temperature spray paint. Clean the vents and you're probably gonna have to replace a couple broken appliances that you didn't notice were broken, right? You, you don't get to run the oven through every cycle um, possible, usually on a home inspection. So you're probably gonna find some little issues. Okay, just about done here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so stuff that I want you to kind of like, it's, you know, sometimes it may be true, but stuff that I want you to kind of raise an eyebrow out. You know, somebody says, oh yeah, it's 30 minutes outside of town, but tenants will drive far for new construction. Uh, let me, let me tell you, as somebody who has years of experience leasing apartments, generally no, they won't. Granite and stainless steel, no, they're not worth it. No, they're not. I don't like them in rental property. Stainless steel uh, appliances are too easily beat up. Generally in the properties I'd like you to buy, which are middle income properties, there's nothing wrong with just clean and white. Uh, my first place had black and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. It never looked clean. So there's nothing wrong with newer white. If you go stainless steel, that's cool. Just know that they, they get beat up quick. Um, don't let anybody tell you that, oh, sure, the rents are down, but we'll throw some fresh paint and carpet and the rents will go up. That's not how that works. Okay. Amanda and I were joking about this as we were prepping for this presentation, how sick of hearing that we are because that's not how it works. It might rent a little bit faster, it might rent to a better tenant, but it's not, you're not, you're generally not going to see a return on investment on a monthly kind of basis. You'll see it in less vacancy because it rented faster. Um, you don't have the power to just raise the rents. The rents are what the rents are, okay? The, the economy, all the complexity, Adam Smith's invisible hand gets to determine the rents, you don't. So talk to a good property manager who will be honest with you and not going to just tell you what you want to hear and they'll tell you what the rents are going to be. The other way you can do is shop Craigslist. Um, just keep in mind, Craigslist is asking prices. It's not getting prices. If they were getting those prices, they wouldn't be on Craigslist anymore. So typically take those prices with a grain of salt and lower them a little bit and you'll probably get closer to reality. Property values do not always go up. Take that from someone who bought his first home in 2006 on a zero down VA and got his butt handed to him for 13 years owning that place. Called it my great recession participation trophy. So no, property values do not always go up. You can always refinance it, you can always sell it. Okay, I bought a property in Oklahoma and shortly after buying it, Obama disallowed the uh, refinances within six months and we were host. We couldn't turn and flip it, now we were landlords. So that is not always the case. You always need a plan A, plan B, plan C. Um, all the tenants have been here for years. That might be true. Sometimes it is. Um, I kind of file that under uh, therefore what? It generally means the units are trashed. Um, it generally means that the owner has been letting them get away with stuff. So sometimes it means you just have great tenants. So it can, it's kind of just a flip of the coin. Um, yeah, it's more of a therefore what. Um, Non-conforming fourplex. So those of you who are not in the business, non-conforming, a really common thing is you see these fourplexes that were slapped together in the 1970s or 1980s, and at some point in time, somebody added a fifth unit. Here's how that works. You can rent it. You can put a human body in it. But the day it catches fire, and fourplexes catch fire on a surprisingly regular basis, you will not get to build another fiveplex. So if you paid fiveplex prices 
for what is effectively now a fourplex, you're going to be kicking yourself. So non-conforming fourplexes can be cool. However, keep in mind, the Muni is very hostile towards these things right now. Don't worry, it's grandfathered in. Okay, this is like, this is like the urban myth of real estate. Okay, this idea of grandfathering something in. Um, if it ain't in writing, it doesn't exist. I want to see something from the Muni saying that this is quote unquote grandfathered in. Otherwise, it just, you know, I might as well tell, tell you I wrote a Pegasus to work today. Um, have you noticed how many times I've talked about using a spreadsheet on this presentation? Almost none. Okay. Should you use a spreadsheet? Yes. But did we just spend an hour and a half talking about stuff that has nothing to do with your spreadsheet? Absolutely. Okay. Um, there's a lot more to it than calling some property manager in the middle of a Tuesday and asking him what the vacancy rate is and plugging that into the column on your spreadsheet. Okay. There's a lot of moving parts. These are not single variable equations. There's a lot going on. There are unpredictable, irrational people living in these properties that do unpredictable, irrational people things. So there's a lot going on. Yes, you should run a spreadsheet. Yes, you should know the numbers. Yes, you should know what cash and cash return is and cap rate and all that stuff, all that, all that bigger pockets jargon. You should probably learn that. But once you have a cool spreadsheet put together, does that make you the next Robert Kiyosaki? No, it does not. Okay. So I, what drives me insane is how many investors will go out and make a $500,000 decision without having spent five minutes sitting out front of the property and just watching the thing. Again, just go get in your car, go park out there, go watch the place, go see what's going on, go drive around the block. Do you like it? Do you like the neighbors? Do you like the schools? Do you like the restaurants nearby? And this, so many investors make great decisions when they're buying on FHA and VA loans because guess what? They care because they have to live there. But then all of a sudden they get a little bit of equity and they don't have to live there anymore. And it's like they throw all that good, all those good ideas in the trash and just start staring at Excel sheets. Okay. So put the same amount of due diligence into the place. Again, this comes back into, would you live there? All right, so now that I've berated you with my nasally drone for the last hour and a half, um, here is our phone numbers and websites. 